occupations in recent Estonian history, 1940 to 1991. Liberation, 1987-1991. The unfortunate war in Afghanistan, the sharp drop in the price of crude oil, and a decline in arms sales, these led the USSR into a dead end. With each passing year during the course of the Cold War and the arms race, the empire became progressively weaker, both economically and strategically. The leadership in Moscow was supposed to try to reform, renew, and restructure the system. The leaders turned their eyes away from the top echelons of the Communist Party and sought the support of the people. They tried to improve their reputation in the eyes of the world, which meant that they had to stop exerting political pressure. These were dangerous, even desperate measures, particularly as regards the Baltic countries. The Estonian people were supposedly resigned to everything, to a massive influx of settlers, russification and long lines that formed at the doors of shops with empty shelves. Now the people began to get over the fear that had numbed them for centuries. A new period of national awakening had begun. The so-called phosphorite war had just ended, and fairly successfully since it put a stop to the mining operations. That was when we set up the Estonian Group for the Disclosure of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact during the summer of 1987. At the outset, four persons belonged to that group, Tiet Madison, Heik Jahonen, Jan Kerb and myself, Lagle Parek. At the beginning, we weren't thinking of Hirbe Park or demonstrations. We thought that we were going to wage a big war on paper. We turned to the Estonian newspapers with a public letter asking them to print the text of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, including its secret protocols. In August 1987, the time was not yet ripe for the publication of the pact. We received no written reply. I'd been in Riga visiting with the Latvians. They had marked the anniversary of the deportations in 1987 with a demonstration. We reached agreement with the Latvians and the Lithuanians that a protest meeting would be arranged on August 23rd. We informed an Estonian refugee organization in Sweden, the Relief Center for Imprisoned Estonian Freedom Fighters. The leader of that organization, Jaak Juriado, took a great deal of trouble to pass on our information, and it was relayed primarily by international radio stations the Voice of America and Radio Free Europe. On August 23rd, quite a few people gathered at Town Hall Square. From there, we proceeded to Hirve Park where speeches were given. The media paid a lot of attention to the event. One couldn't say that these articles were exactly objective, but in any event there were a lot of abusive articles. The period of awakening. Three days after the events of Hirve Park, the newspapers published a proposal outlining a program of economic self-sufficiency for Estonia. This was a concept of regional economic autonomy for the Estonian SSR. I think the issue of where to start is our big problem. There are enterprises on the territory of our Union Republic that answer to all Union ministries. Others get their orders from joint all Union and Republican ministries or ministries purely on the Republican level. Not all of these are completely subordinated to our Council of Ministers. It seems to make sense that all enterprises and units that produce things here in the Estonian SSR ought to be 100% governed by our Council of Ministers. At that point in time, to dare to gather in public was something that required a good deal of courage. As recently as February the 2nd, the Soviet police had used dogs to disperse a meeting in Tartu. This demonstration at the Tamsara monument in Tallinn was unquestionably a moral victory. Think a little bit about Perestroika. What is it based on? On Gorbachev's policies, of course. He succeeded in reaching agreement with Reagan. Doesn't it remind you of Stalinism? It's the same thing. Don't interrupt. And now a handful of U.S. senators wants to manipulate us so that the agreement won't be signed. 
At the joint plenum of the executive committees of the creative unions, issues pertaining to the arts were practically ignored. The speech is concentrated instead on heartfelt concern about Estonia and the destiny of our people and culture. Others are governing us politically and economically. Those of us who have been functionaries have never conveyed the interests, wishes and aspirations of the people to the higher level. Instead, they have only passed the messages of the central apparat in a downward direction. Their function has never been to lead this group, the Estonians, even though they have been put at the fore. They have dealt instead with subordinating the Estonians, with selling us down the river. We should learn from the Old Testament, from the Jews, and from other people with long histories. We have to maintain the struggle for a hundred or two hundred or three hundred years. Only then will we taste victory. This was ten days after the arrival in Munich of the issue of Sirp that contained an overview of the proceedings of the plenum. I read it and my hands were shaking. I thought, this just isn't possible. It can end in just one of two ways. Estonia will either become free or be destroyed. They'd simply overstep the boundary. It had been possible to try to dismiss the organizers of the Hirve Park meeting as mere dissidents and outsiders, but when people of stature in Estonian society spoke up and their comments got published, I said that there are only two roads that lay before us. One leads to total destruction, brutal repressions in the end of the Estonian culture, or we will attain independence. I said to my wife at the time when we went out for a stroll, this is going to end up in our moving to Estonia. The Estonian Heritage Society was the first democratic organization to evolve from a popular movement. The Tartu Heritage Days, which took place two weeks after the joint plenum of the creative unions, was a test of strength. It showed that the authorities had lost the courage to disperse and arrest people. The strength of the Heritage Society lay in the fact that, unlike our freedom fighters, who bore prison sentences and were few in number compared to us, and who spoke the whole truth in one fell swoop, and who went to prison and had a singular and very important historical role to play, we were like the next echelon. Our strength lay in the fact that we would take a partial step over the forbidden line at a time, and consequently there were many of us. Many people joined us, and soon it became clear that we were causing the flows of ice to buckle and move. The Heritage Days in Tartu turned out to be the high point of the Heritage Movement. If there is one thing that the Heritage Society deserves credit for, although this wasn't its only contribution, the Estonian Heritage Society was the first after World War II to usher in the large-scale reappearance of Estonia's blue, black and white flag. This caused a psychological transformation. It is safe to say that by doing this, the Heritage Society earned a place in history and also fulfilled its historical mission. In 1988, a number of political currents began to take shape. In the space that existed between the internationalist died in the wool loyalist communists and the radical national movement, an attempt was made to create a fusion of perestroika and the nationally minded movement. This hybrid type of person attempted to be an Estonian, a homo sovieticus, and a communist all at the same time. The Popular Front for the Support of Perestroika, which was founded on April 13th, developed into a large people's movement. Yuri Kuk was a principled freedom fighter. He died in Vologda prison and was buried in 1989 at the Kursi Cemetery. During four nights, a spontaneous singing revolution took place at Tallinn's Song Festival grounds. On June 17th, a huge popular front demonstration would follow, nominally for the purpose of sending off delegates to a Communist Party conference in Moscow.
The people have found their voices once again. They sense their power. The meeting with the delegates to the 19th All-Union Party Conference that took place in Tallinn on the evening of June 17th, which was arranged by the Initiative Center of the Popular Front, was an unforgettable experience for all who were present. Big bosses arrived from Moscow. A staff was created on the fifth floor of the committee and tens of workers were sent to the song festival grounds. Lieutenant Colonel Podpolkovnik Yuri Latsev was designated to be the leader of this operative group. This is what the radio traffic sounded like. One, this is five, the people are gathering, over. Some minutes later, one, this is five, people are arriving from all over, there are thousands of them, over. A little more time goes by, one, this is five, fifty thousand have gathered. A lot of time went by and then Moscow asked, what's going on there, where is five? We were considering sending a backup. One, one, this is five. Soviet power has just gone down the toilet. Many of you had already lost hope, complacency replaced willingness in people's hearts. People's convictions were swallowed up by everyday politics. This period is now coming to an end. On July 1st, demonstrators began to picket the Supreme Court building in Tallinn, demanding that political prisoners be released. Within two weeks, prisoner of conscience Mark Nichols had been released. The picket line remained in place until September. During the summer, a blatantly Stalinist and imperially-minded internationalist movement was established in opposition to the Popular Front. The movement demanded that the Communist Party grant additional rights to non-Estonians. A big issue is being made of linguistic ability. The amount of time that someone has lived in Estonia is being taken into account, as is participation or lack of participation in national movements. Determination of citizenship based on these criteria would divide citizens into real and non-citizens. In the Soviet Union there is but one citizenship for everyone, citizen of the Soviet Union. The Estonian political prisoner Mark Niklas has been released. He served two sentences in Mordovia, a total of fifteen and a half years. I don't believe the fact that I was released from hell on earth was an act of humanity on the part of our government. I am indebted instead to international public opinion and the Estonian people. The Estonian National Independence Party was established at the party's Congress in Pilistre on August 20th. The ENIP called for total political, economic and cultural independence for Estonia, which put it on a clear course of confrontation with the Communist Party. The activities of the ENIP are based on the rock-solid conviction that the Estonian people are politically ready for independence and don't need nursemaids from either the East or the West. National independence is the only thing that will deliver Estonia from colonial dependence and back the political, economic and cultural sovereignty of Estonia. On September 11th, a very big political meeting of the Popular Front, Estonia's song took place at Tallinn Song Festival grounds, attracting 300,000 persons. One out of three Estonians attended that meeting. The speakers called for an independent Estonian state. The day will come when the blue, black and white flag will fly above the tall Hermann Tower. Sooner or later, victory will be ours. It's 
Néstor, me voy dame, ni voy ni. The Popular Front for the Propagation of Perestroika was not a political party, but a people's movement. 28% of the members were also members of the Communist Party. People's fronts were established all at the same time throughout the Soviet Union. In 1988, the vision of the People's Front involved Estonia remaining within the structure of the Soviet Union on the basis of a union treaty. The Congress adopted the program of the People's Front, its charter and resolutions pertaining to the most acute problems of Estonia. A seven-member executive committee and a council were chosen. Changes in the Constitution of the USSR, limiting the rights of republics, these were passed on October 21st, were met with a wave of protest. The Supreme Soviet of the Estonian SSR adopted a declaration of sovereignty within the Union. The Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR responded by annulling the declaration. The Supreme Soviet of the Estonian SSR sees only one way out of this difficult situation. Estonia's future development must take place under conditions of sovereignty. The sovereignty of the Estonian SSR means that it must possess ultimate power over its territory through the institutions of government and the courts. The sovereignty of the Estonian SSR is both integral and indivisible. Because of this, the future status of the Republic should be affirmed through a union treaty. The blue, black and white flag was made legal again in Estonia as of Midsummer Night's Eve 1988. Nationally minded circles considered the official raising of the flag above the tall Hermann Tower under circumstances where Estonia wasn't independent to be an act of misleading Soviet incitement. Even so, the crowd was moved to tears by the event. The 28th of April, the Numma House of Culture. This was the first district of Tallinn where a committee of citizens was established. Committees for the registration of Estonian citizens have also been set up in other parts of Estonia. Honored residents of Numme, it is my pleasure to greet you on behalf of the Ad Hoc Communications Working Group of the Committee of Citizens. On the anniversary of the founding of the Republic, the Movement of Citizens' Committees was launched. This movement emphasized the legal continuity of the Republic of Estonia. The committees began to register persons who could prove that they were Estonian citizens. On the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the peoples of the Baltic states formed a human chain 600 kilometers long, an undertaking organized by the Popular Fronts. Two million people joined hands in a chain that extended from Tallinn to Vilnius. World public opinion took notice of the human chain. Three days later, the Central Committee of the Soviet Communist Party made blood-chilling threats to the Baltic states. If the nationalist leaders happened to attain their goals, catastrophic consequences may befall the people of these countries. Indeed, it is not certain that they will continue to exist. Unless we set the record straight concerning the historical events of 1940, regardless of how painful the truth might be, the authority of the Communist Party of Estonia cannot be restored, nor can we make the plans that would enable us to move ahead. The Supreme Soviet adopted a decision that declared Estonia's entry into the Soviet Union to be null and void. A formulation was added stating that this should not be construed as secession from the Soviet Union. 
How can we protect ourselves from the danger that we might end up situated outside of the borders of the USSR, which would place us under the influence of the nationalistic separatists of the Popular Front? There is but one way out of this. In accordance with the Constitution of the USSR, we have to create our own autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic in northern and northeastern Estonia. In anticipation of the 70th anniversary of the Tartu Peace Treaty, the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet convened the plenary meeting of all people's representatives from all levels at the Tallinn City Meeting Hall to declare Estonian independence. The event helped to draw the attention to the wish for freedom both domestically and in foreign countries. The majority of the votes at the plenary session belong to delegates who were partial to Moscow. The participation of soldiers contributed to their having the votes that they needed. Velyas was able to hold them in check. They couldn't openly oppose him. Still, it needs to be said that the inter-movement and other such things weren't local phenomena. These were movements organized in Moscow. There was an organizing section within the Central Committee of the party. Now we can say it, without beating around the bush, that it did the bidding of the imperial interests of that large state. However, there was also the Department of Ideology, meaning Yakovlev. They were the driving force behind Perestroika. To be honest, no one outside the USSR was willing to believe these things. Estonia had reached a decisive point. How to attain independence should this be done within the legal framework of the USSR, breaking away from the Soviet Union as one of her successor states, or by staying on the path of Estonia's uninterrupted legal continuity, which neither occupation nor annexation had succeeded in destroying. The question of the moment was how to restore independence in reality, de facto. The Congress of Estonia, which represented Estonia's citizens and the restitutional approach, did not try to assume power, for that wasn't a realistic option. Instead, it declared the beginning of a period of transition that would restore independence. Well, that angle of legal continuity is right, of course. I have no desire to quarrel with you about that. Still, let's go back in time and think about the ramifications of that ideology. To say that we are right and we're occupied, and that we have the Tartu Peace Treaty to rely on and agreed upon borders from that point in history, and we are now going to elect a body that represents our citizens, and this body has the right to assume power, because there was talk of taking power. And then we're going to go to Moscow, and in Moscow they're going to understand that we really are the representatives of our citizens on the basis of legal continuity, and then we are going to be received and they are going to negotiate with us, and the result will be independence for Estonia. Well, in my opinion, and probably in the opinion of other Popular Front leaders, that path would have gone nowhere. Moscow would only have been open to discussions with some sort of a structure that had been formed on the basis of the laws of the Soviet Union at that point in time. From the word go, the citizens' committees were a renegade organization from Moscow's point of view. Not from our perspective, but from Moscow's point of view. Even now, in 2003, they are still not willing to admit that they occupied us, that the border should be in a different location where it was previously. If these things haven't been done by now, why should anyone think that they would have done so in 1989? <laughs> Persons who had arrived with the forces of occupation took part of electing the 12th Supreme Soviet, and they were also among the candidates elected. Even so, this Supreme Soviet recognized the Congress of Estonia as the representative body of the citizens of Estonia and the structure engaged in restoring the authority of the state, and it passed a decision of restitution. This entailed the uncoupling of Estonia from the Soviet system and signified the beginning of the period of transition. 
At the beginning, we didn't really believe that it would be possible to become independent in, let's say, the year 1991. That seemed outside the realm of doability. Our idea was to keep strengthening the status of the Republic. The project basically had two aspects. One of these involved the tax that we had to pay to the Union. A lot of discussion was devoted to that, and it seemed that if you belonged somewhere, it wouldn't be appropriate to not pay. So the question was, on what basis and calculations were made to come up with a formula that would enable us to pay as little as possible. The other topic was that of military forces. We discussed the creation of an Estonian army at that same session of the Deliberative Council for Economic Self-Sufficiency. It took a certain amount of courage to discuss these things, and it was foolhardy as well, since, to be honest, too many people were present to discuss such a delicate issue. During times of radical change, appearances of reality are not all that important. The ability to see farther, to perceive the reality of what tomorrow will bring is important. Nationally minded democratic circles in Estonia believed that the point had been passed where it might be possible to save the Soviet Union by reforming it. We saw an opportunity in this. Consequently, we set our sights on an all-out effort, on total freedom. On the 14th of May, the President of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev, announced that the decisions of the Supreme Soviets of Estonia and Latvia concerning independence were invalid. On the following day, the inner movement held a demonstration on Tompea, the seat of Estonia's government, with the goal of tearing down the Estonian flag and running up the red flag. The Supreme Soviet of the Estonian SSR had restored the name of the Republic of Estonia and divested itself of the symbols of the Soviet Union, the flag, the coat of arms and the anthem. Prime Minister Savisar appeared in a radio broadcast and called on the people to come to the assistance of the government to repel the tumultuous attackers. The attempted tour de force of the inner movement failed. Moscow felt that it was high time to tame the Baltic countries. In April 1989, demonstrators had been bloodied in Tbilisi. Now the Gulf War was beginning in Kuwait, and it was expected that the attention of the world would be focused on the Middle East. They tried to goad us into spilling blood here. In Latvia and Lithuania, they set up so-called committees of national salvation, which were urged on by Moscow. They were told, pull out all the stops. In three days, we will recognize you. You will become the leaders of the republic. Later, they were pushed aside, blood flowed, and they were simply discarded. Judgment is still being passed on them, they are being imprisoned. Our situation was like that when Yarovoy held a meeting with us, having invited us to the Dvigatel plant. They made repeated calls to him from Moscow and insisted he set up a committee of liberation. I said no, and there were hard feelings. We stopped greeting each other. I comprehended what was going on. Blood was spilled in Latvia and Lithuania. Opponents of secession were smeared. They are still being repressed as we speak. This didn't happen here. In Vilnius, the special Omon police force killed civilians at the television transmission tower. On the same day, Russia's President Yeltsin came to Tallinn and signed some agreements of cooperation with representatives of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania and condemned the use of force. Yeltsin acknowledged the sovereignty of the Baltic countries even though the disintegration of the USSR was not something he wanted.
Moscow decided to arrange a referendum throughout the Soviet Union concerning the need to maintain the USSR. As a counter move, the Baltic countries held a preemptive plebiscite. Nearly 80% of the residents of Estonia voted for independence. When news arrived of the putsch in Moscow, it was certain that tanks would also arrive in Tallinn. There was but one question, for how long and what would they do here? Would it be possible to turn back the wheel of history with their help? It was good that despite the complexity of the situation, Estonia's political groupings, which differed a lot, found one another and that a joint solution was found. It could easily have happened that the Supreme Soviet would have declared the restoration of the Republic of Estonia and declared itself the sole legitimate power in the country shouldering aside the Congress of Estonia. That would have involved a different turn of events, and I believe those political tensions would have been reflected in society. Honorable members of the Supreme Council, who is in favor of adopting the decision of the Supreme Council of the Republic of Estonia concerning national independence? I am putting it to a vote. 53 votes. Sixty-nine deputies are in favor of the decision, none against and no abstentions. The decision is passed. The Executive Committee of the Congress of Estonia participated in the drafting of the Supreme Council's decision. The Supreme Council didn't proclaim the creation of a new republic, nor did it proclaim the secession of a Union Republic from the Soviet Union. Estonia restored her independence de facto, which had never been interrupted in the legal sense. On August 21st, Soviet shock troops seized the bottom floors of the Tallinn television tower. Television programming ceased, but radio transmissions continued. The people were kept informed of what was taking place. The August putsch in Moscow left no choice. The restoration of the independence of the Republic had to be declared. By the 21st, it was apparent that the putsch attempt had failed in Moscow. In Tallinn, no one knew if it would be possible to avoid bloodshed. It was not until the departure of the shock troops that it became possible to exercise all of the functions of a state. Control was taken of union-level agencies, state property and the border. Estonia re-established her independence a mere three days before the 52nd anniversary of the fateful Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. The armored vehicles departed the area at the foot of the television tower before the sun had set, and during the same night they left Tallinn. The leadership of the Communist Party of Estonia didn't bring independence to Estonia. They were too busy trying to maintain their leading positions. Even the Estonian people, who had been united by the singing revolution, had not been able to attain independence through their own devices. The Baltic countries were saved by historical happenstance. The weakened Soviet Union simply didn't have the courage to continue to drown in blood the unceasing yearning for freedom of the peoples of Eastern Europe. The Western countries, particularly the United States and her NATO partners, applied pressure in defense of the Baltic nations. The countries of the world were quick to recognize the independence that Estonia had reinstituted on August 21, 1991, and Russia, the successor state of the Soviet Union, withdrew the last occupation forces in August of 1994, after 54 years of presence here. Deep wounds lingered after the occupation, particularly in the hearts and minds of the people, but the Estonian people are up to the task of ministering to those injuries. <laughs>